Eugene basically this week came out with a really great article on using LLM as a judge. So we're all just asking him some questions. So yeah, we're going to bring back Hamo and then I'll let Hamo and Eugene <laughs> chat about this while I uh, eat my lunch. So we were just talking about literature review. Yeah. But like how useful have you found literature review? Like how does it map? To, there's a lot of noise. And especially when you bring it down to applied context. Yep. I find that it's very noisy. Yeah. Like, how do you integrate that into your research? I know you are looking at it from an applied lens. Yeah, that's that's true. Uh, maybe I can share my screen to take you through my process. This is what I want to share. Actually, I want to share the entire window. No, I just share the entire screen. So this is how my. So firstly, the question you have is, how is literature review? Is it useful or not? I think it's very useful. I think it's almost like the mindset I have is respect what came before. So right now we're trying to solve a problem, which is, you know, maybe using LM as a judge. And I think I don't claim to know anything about it. That's why I always talk to a lot of people about how they do it. And I also read a lot of what folks recommend as good papers to see how other people have done it. And I think, Hemo, you had a good point whereby a lot of stuff I try to do is apply it. And yes, that's true. I have this repo. It's all about papers or technical articles, but from the industry perspective. So all of these are... They have companies next to them. So we know that they have done it in production and it works. I've tried to do the same thing, but the thing is because LLM evaluators are so new, there's very little people talking about it right now. There's very little, pub, especially in production. So what I tend to is these papers. So is it useful? It's extremely useful. At least I know I can read through, understand what works, what doesn't work. I can look at how some people are measuring things. And for me, sometimes it has a bad smell. So for example, sometimes people measure things in terms of correlations. I think correlation is a fairly bad smell. I think it really doesn't translate production. So when I come across those, I say, like, okay, I'll just take it with a pinch of salt. But then some papers actually do report, report recall and precision. So those are extremely valuable to me. Okay. So you mentioned you were skeptical, but you looked at the literature and you, you also did your own research. Experiments. So when did you stop being skeptical through the process or when, when was there like a point where you're like, oh, I'm not skeptical anymore. Which one of those activities? So let me share why I was skeptical. I think this time last year, this time, the same time, one year ago, I actually tried it. I actually tried it really intensively. I was mostly using some of the middle size, like the best models at that point in time. You can think of it like for two or 3.5 turbo, except using like the GPT-4s or the, the most expensive ones. I tried it really extensive, a lot of prime engineering, and it just didn't work as good as a fine-tuned model. So at a point in time, no. And of course, latency and all the considerations aside, it just doesn't work as well. So at that point in time, it's like I did try it extensively and just doesn't work. But then after that, I shared my results. I spoke at AI Engineer. I spoke at the Netflix conference. I shared my results. And I also wrote about the extensive. A lot of people actually reached out to me, like Shreya or Ham or, or Han. It's Shreya clearly said she's bullish on LLM evals. So I was like, okay, I need to think this through a little harder because I know Shreya is a very thoughtful person. Ham is a very thoughtful person, very careful. And when they say that they use it and there's something to it, I feel like, okay, I need to recalibrate myself. I need to dive deeper into it. And then I spoke to way, way more people. I think more than a dozen people with very deep conversations. Like, Hamo, you remember there was once we had Omakase and Shreya Raj Powell was there. And I had an extremely long and sorry, Shreya, for in interrogating you then. But that was a very enjoyable conversation. And I start to see... You were on a mission during that trip. You talked to everybody like that you could about this subject. I was talking to so many people, Josh, Shreya, and then recently also some folks from Arise. Like, I've been really studying this really deep. Vibu, etc., Raza. Everyone had such different views. And then I dug in the literature. I ran my own experiments now with slightly better models. I loosen my constraints a bit. Now I'm not purely going for latency. I allow myself to use chain of thought or dynamic few short, and it's able to actually get better to a satisfactory level of performance. So it's like, okay, I've done it. I have to make sure I can replicate it for myself. I have to make sure I can apply it broadly in my circumstance. And that's how I convince myself. Mostly like yeah. just chatting with other people who have gotten it to work. And of course, trying it myself to make sure that I trust it. No. You mentioned you tried it before and the results didn't impress you. And then you sounds like you may have tried it again recently. What did you do differently that you think led to it working? Or was it just the models got a lot better? I think it's a bit, it's two. One of it is some of the models have, have gotten a bit better. So like 4.0 or 3.5. Huh. In fact, from Claude 2 to Claude 3, that's a big jump. 
because now we have 3.5 solid. That's a big jump as well. And then, of course, there's also things like I, I loosen my constraints, right? Previously, I was like going for extremely high throughput, extremely low latency. Now I loosen my constraints, allow chain of thought, allow bigger prompts, and that helps. And of course, okay, maybe I'll think about it differently. If you're thinking about it as an evaluator, which is, I actually have written about it. So here's the secret sauce. Um, Are you sharing your screen? I'm going to be sharing my screen just okay. right okay. now. So here's the secret sauce. So you don't, I actually don't really say it openly, but if you just want to cut to the chase, you can scroll all the way to the bottom. And I try to guide people how to think about it here. I, I, I don't put it up front. A lot of people say you could have gotten way more readership if you just put this up front. No, I actually want people to work through it. I want people to sweat by reading through it. But if you read through all of it and you summarize it, right at the bottom here is that if you're only using it as an evaluator and only on a couple hundred samples, running it through an LLM API with chain of thought, everything, an hour would be fine. Because what you're comparing then is comparing the human validation, which is a lot more subjective, which would take a long time. But if you're thinking about it as a guardrail, which is on the bottom right, whereby you want to run on everything. Latency and throughput is a huge consideration. Therefore, you probably want to fine tune and classify real model. With a couple, couple of lines of code, you could actually do that. But it's getting the data. How to actually collect that high quality data and, and evaluate that. That's, that's a bit tricky. So I find also... this uh, diagram to be quite interesting in one area. And I see that maybe it's a mix of a decision tree and also a map of sorts. Yeah. But like on the left-hand side, you have one, can the task be simplified to binary? And I think the two branches are there are meant to inform you about what metrics you can use. But I'm more curious about zooming in on this for a second. Did you find that the LLM as a judge is less likely to work? Or more, or is just the same, whether or not you can simplify the task to binary. If you can't simplify it to binary, what did you find? Is it still a reasonable idea, or what? So everything I'm going to respond. My response is going to be based on what I've read in literature. In my experiments, I've always simplified it to binary. So what I've seen in the literature is that if you can simplify it to binary, it actually performs a lot better. And empirically, a lot of people have said that simplifying the true or false actually leads to more reliability, like better recall and precision instead of giving a like a task, giving it like a scale or, or whatever. And of course, if you go all the way to the right, which is using a pairwise comparison, that actually works even better than asking it to return true or false. But a lot of times we can't actually do that. Sometimes our task is more objective. So long story short, yes, simplifying the binary actually leads to better perform performance. Sounds good. So I think maybe it's a good idea to maybe zoom out. Maybe you can take us through the post a bit. Okay, I can try that. That's a lot. Uh, you can maybe oh. summarize it. Pretend you're an LLM summarizing each section. Can I actually come in and, and ask one question? Yeah, go ahead, Jason. <laughs> yes. So you mentioned using chain of thought improves your ability to be aligned with human preferences. I'm curious, do you have any numbers or, or metrics on how you, one, what was the performance improvement relative to the latency cost? And has it been the case that it, it's almost always worth it, right? It's never the, for example, we could get a 2% accuracy improvement with a 60% latency. That seems really bad. But from your experience, what has been the general sort of proportions when it comes to latency versus accuracy trade-offs? Because I was doing offline testing, I never really cared about latency, but I, I've seen like 12% improvement in classification accuracy. And to me, it, it would be hard to even exp like justify what latency would make me not choose to do chain of thought. That makes sense. I fully agree. I'll talk about it two things. One is the metrics and one is the latency. So the metrics wise, it is going from unusable. So it, it just, there's no need to justify. It's like even without it, it's just not usable, right? Latency, if you think about it, if it's just returning true or returning false, it's probably two or three tokens. That's very fast, right? Machine of thought is fairly detailed. Step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, several steps to make it help it think a little bit better. And that's maybe like 10 to 15 seconds. So it's a huge increase, but it is usable now. So yeah, so questions at all. So we, if I cannot accept chain of thought, there's just no way for me to use it. Has there been any kind of ROC curve with or without chain of thought? You have any? That, I would love to see that. That's a great question. An ROC curve usually typically works. You, you can do it with true or false, but an ROC curve works best if your results are in probabilities. So you can actually see that curve, but if it's not in probability, so I simplified it to just true or false. Now, a lot of times when you compare it to a previous fine tune model, the ROC curve is people mm -hmm. say the ROC or 
the PRAC is way better. That's the thing, it hides it. Because the model can only return one or zero, using ROC or PRAC is unfairly disadvantaging it. But when we look at the raw position and recall and the trade-off, at the different threshold is just way better. I so, see, yeah. I see. To add to that, you this may be going too deep into the, the modeling, but maybe this is something you're interested in. Have you looked at any kind of ensembling where maybe, for example, at a high temperature, maybe we try multiple suites of models? Because then we might be able to get some kind of ROC out. Because to me, I just really want to see a curve that says unusable per 50%. Should we share your screen right now? Or? Are you seeing my screen right now? No. Mm. Yeah. Oh, wait, I thought I was sharing. I'm sharing this. I just, share. I just put it on okay. screen. Uh, okay, there's this great paper from some folks I call here. So essentially, they're using three smaller LLMs, Command R, GPT-2.5, and Haiku, and comparing it against GPT-4. So they do use this, and it does perform better. But again, the output is really just yes or no. It's just true or false. What I used to do is I used to get LLMs to try to return me a probability, and I'll, I'll provide quite a few examples to try, try to help you calibrate the probability. And the probability is, it's, it's really the, the, the decimal is only to a single decimal. It's really hard to get it to calibrate well to double decimal. Uh, but for single decimal, I was able to do it well. And actually I was able to get uh, decent results there. But so many people have said that just getting it to return true or false is probably better. And it simplifies things a lot. So I've mostly now been a Boolean convert. I, I, I don't use decimal places, memory results anymore. But long, story, long and short of it is that by combining these three models, you can see that they get far better results than using a single strong model, which is GPT-4. I've never tried not to use chain of thought in judges. I didn't, the thought didn't even occur to me to try that. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I need it. I like, Hello, you, you do that. The thing is... Uh, yeah, I always use chain of thought every time. Yeah. I, just, I don't know, because I want to see... Because I have the human do chain of thought, like critiques. Exactly. So I see I see your, I've seen your critique where you actually use chain of thought, and I am pulling it up right now. So you can see this is the critique, right? The model actually returns a Oh, actually, yeah, the model actually returns a critique first, then it returns an outcome. So this is chain of thought. Yeah, and so, I never yeah. do non-binary. I didn't even think of, I mean, I didn't even try because yeah. it's just, I'm like, how am I going to execute that? I'm not going to tell the humans to like have a score or like grade on the scale and normalize them. I don't want to, that's just complicated. It's not, I'm not going to be able to execute that. Yeah. It seems like you stumbled into what is the best practice-ish what most people are doing right now. At least that's what I'm doing right now. Fascinating. Have you, here's another question, which I do in practice, but I've been too lazy to measure these things. So we just deployed them. Have you looked at models where we will use say GPT-4? with train of thought to make a prediction. And then when, if you want to fine tune a model, fine tune it without the train of thought. Has there been any metrics there to say, okay, let's just use train of thought to get higher quality training data, but still try to predict without it. Like I can, I imagine there's some loss, but I can also imagine there's some improvement over the baseline with no chain of thought. Those are the kind of experiments I want to try to have Ivan take a look at in the future. Yeah, fine tuning. I like having the chain of thought in the fine tune. If it's high quality, if it's mm -hmm. like really high quality, especially if it's human written, there is no way in hell I would leave that out, especially in the judge case, because usually mm -hmm. judge cases are doing offline. So I'm like, whatever, just, I don't, I just want it to be good. I think there were a few synthetic data set papers whereby they actually got some model to return chain of thought and the result. And after that, they just fine tune solely on the result. It actually is better than just if the model, if they fine tune on data that didn't have the chain of thought. But when they fine tune, they actually didn't use the chain of thought. Essentially, it's just getting better labels and then you just find, distill that to a smaller model. Interesting. Can you share the data set that Cohere used for, I think Sandra just posted, maybe it's this link here, but. Yeah, they use this data set. It's essentially question answering data sets. Yeah. I want to see if one of the questions that I've had is I almost surely believe that structured output reduces its, a language model's ability to reason, but I have yet to see evals on what is the best ideal structure, right? Correct right. answer is a string or should it be a list of strings or should it be some other uh, structure that happens? Even when the reasoning is in the structure, like the first field in the JSON? I don't really know like what the loss is because it's not really chain of thought the way that la language models have been trained to do chain of thought, where mm. in chain of thought, you pre-fill less things step by step. And then, yeah, I'm just always curious if there's a performance difference, because I think in the first version of Instructor, there was like a 
improvement just by saying return the correct schema versus return the schema. And so if those things are giving me double digit percentage improvements, I feel like it's worthwhile to spend like 400 bucks on open AI credits to figure out what's the best way of doing things. I just want to also call out, we have 730 viewers right now. Which so one hack to get to answer all these experiments is if you have friends that have these like observability companies like Brain Trust or Arise, they actually love doing these experiments because it's in the, they like share it. It's good yeah. content for them. Yeah. I recommend to the extent you can leverage that situation to explore your curiosity. I did that with modal, right? I yeah. did all those fine tuning experiments for embedding models. And then I was like, great. Now we know 2000 triplets is enough to outperform open AI. Yes. That's a close enough number to what I've gotten to. I, I feel like 2000 is the tipping point. In fact, sometimes you can, you may even get 600 to a thousand, maybe even be enough if your task is simple enough, but yeah, essentially it's, you don't actually, when you, when people talk about collecting data to fine tune, you actually don't need that much data. If you're thinking about a thousand or two thousand. But I think now too, like the amount of data you need is like in proportion to the number of parameters your model has, right? If you want to fine tune 70 B versus seven B, I don't think it's an order of 10 magnitude, but it is something like that. Oh yeah. David Alexander said someone did an eval oh, on and showed that the models were 10% worse at coding. So maybe this is human eval or something. I don't really know. The thing about structured output, I'm in two minds about that right now. And maybe you guys can correct me if I'm thinking. I think structured output right now, I have two main forms of structured output and within it, there's a lot more, but the one is, one of it is sketchpad, essentially contain yep. chain of thought in here. And then the other one is label or whatever the actual output is. I find that if I ask it to use structured output, the performance is maybe a little bit better, maybe a little bit worse, not that much difference. But the thing is for the humans, it's way harder to read. So you can imagine if I'm getting Claude to return structure output for all the XML fields and all the chain mm -hmm. of thought and all the different fields, it's actually not easy for the human to read. So I've actually tried to constrain myself so that the sketch pad doesn't actually contain structured output. And I actually don't know if that's the right decision or not, but from the eval so it doesn't make that much of a difference. Why would your scratch pad contain structured output? That's an example of. So you can imagine that I asked the model to read this news article and news articles in XML, create all the different teams and the team in XML, and then finally return a summary and a summary set XML. So if I give the instruction like this with everything in XML, in the sketch pad, you also have all the XMLs. But the thing is, the XMLs are not properly enclosed, and sometimes it's harder to pass, right? That's one. And secondly, the XML, it's not easy for the human to read. So that's why the structure output comes in. I have a little bit of a funny question. Is the, you say the XML is not easy for the human to read. Is that a problem with the user interface of how you're showing the human the data? Because wouldn't that give your UI data reading, whatever, better ways to render it or something? Yeah, that would be amazing. I wish I knew how to do that in Excel <laughs> because right now I'm just mostly pro. Oh yeah, Excel. Yeah, and that not, makes not sense. Too. Jason, you're on mute. I said, if your language model would turn JSON, then you could just uh, ask Claude to write you a uh, React component easily. Yeah. No, I get it. Like, because the moment you start making a React app, then you want to change, it becomes too much of a mess. You're like, let me just stick in uh, Excel. I, I get it. I get it. No, right now it's Excel, but I don't think long term it will be. Uh, we want a way for it for people to easily update collaboration and everything. I definitely am super bullish on uh, Claude artifacts now. I wrote like 15 React apps that I've now shared to people. Yeah. It's super easy to communicate with your developers because you can just build the React app and say, this is the functionality. I want these transitions, make it pretty. Is there a quick way to, that you like to save the code from those artifacts? Oh, I just publish. Like, I don't, yes, okay, I don't, don't about any of the code. It's whoever I delegate to is okay. problem to figure that out. So if you already have that, then how do you use Framer together with artifacts? Just how do you use Framer to get rid of artifacts? I did like separate workflows. Yeah, I just pay oh. somebody. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it's more. I want the landing page to roughly look like this. I'll use. Ah. Okay. Notice that there are drop-down menus for industries, and each industry has use cases. That's just a JSON object that I save somewhere, and now now figure this out. But it's way easier than doing that than like working in Figma or anything. But very high level. So Hamo, Jason, how have your thoughts changed on using LLM as an evaluator? Is it still the same? Do you think, are you more bullish on it? Are you more skeptical on it? I think you have to, at a certain level, you have to try. Yeah, you definitely because have to try. There are certain types of evaluations that just need, they're, they're not deterministic in nature. Yep. You can't, they're rule-based. 
And so you have to try. Let's say like roughly half the time I try to, or maybe a little bit more, like two thirds of the time I try to use LM as a judge. It works fine. Where does it break? Long context, um, extremely hard reasoning, nuance, subjectivity? So usually it's the human that breaks. And what that means is through this process, and I think I've told you this privately, the whole process of LM as a judge is very interesting because it's on one hand, it's aligning the LLM with the human. On the other hand, it's also aligning the human with the LLM. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening in practice is people start to realize, because they're looking very closely at the data and they're like really thinking critically about what is happening. And they're like, huh, this is a very difficult problem. I actually don't know the answer either. And I will struggle. This is not be a, even a feature or even a thing that should even be happening. Like, why is this happening? Or the design of what is happening here doesn't make sense as a product. And they, a lot of times they relax their expectations based upon seeing all the messiness of what's happening. Or we actually then go back and constrain the product and scope it more tightly and try not to let it happen at that stage. But oftentimes like people just develop more empathy for yep. the language model also. And so like when it doesn't work, it's usually a smell for, like, Hey, this is going to be very challenging and people can't articulate the criteria either. They're like, I don't yeah. know. Or they're like, and then they go back and say, okay, like that's the first time that they developed some internalized, like True. what they want they haven't before no matter how much i push on it no matter how much data i send them or how many talks i give on looking at data that is the first time people it's because like, a strong incentive to look at data i'm like hey this thing is going to be the judge before we take no, there's no humans you need to look at it and people will take that very seriously and they're like okay this is all of a sudden pay attention so i don't know that's a weird answer but that's what happens it resonates it really resonates let me try to like add on that a little bit more just because I think it's also the human, but it's, I think it's more to do with the task creator. I think I spent like two or three years working with crowd, like crowdsourced data labeling, right? So I've hired $6 an hour people from Venezuela to do content moderation. I've hired like $4 an hour people in India to do bounty box annotation. I even hired like $15 an hour, like art students to label like whether or not outfits are good, or even like $50 an hour, like English teachers to hmm. create essays. I, I, to me, it's just a, it's just a quality literacy to cost trade-off, right? And so I think that one task is just, are we making the right trade-offs, right? For example, if there are tasks that are ambiguous, usually what we do is we pay labelers multiple times to label it to yeah. humbling humans. And then maybe you can figure out are there labels, labelers that are labeling at random versus adversarial? Can I like fire them? And I think a lot of those skills are underdeveloped in the LLM as a judge world where shouldn't I try to evaluate multiple prompts across multiple models and just assume that, oh, I just have 16 different labelers and are there any techniques to help me ensemble them in a way that I can say, oh, it's best to fire a uh, haiku with this prompt because it's not worth the quality trade-off, right? Maybe the answer is, I should label it 12 times cheaper than the $6 an hour. So I mostly think of in terms of like data quality for some time and dollar of like budget constraint. I, I fully agree with that. Be very difficult is writing the instructions, right? It is always a bit hard. It isn't like 80% of the work in creating these crowd or these data labeling tasks for humans is just writing good descriptions, right? It's, it becomes two shot examples. And then there's some techniques on how you evaluate quality. So for example, when I use humans to describe an image of a piece of clothing with a single image, it is very hard to get unique labels. It's low variance. This is just red shirt. This mm. is just red Hawaiian shirt. But then if you build a different task that says, okay, given two similar shirts, I want to ask the human, what is different about these shirts and in what direction I can distill out higher quality labels. Cause then it becomes, oh, the difference is large versus small graphics, right? I fully agree with that. And writing criteria is actually exceptionally hard. And I recall when Hamo and I were in San Francisco, we actually had a huge debate. Actually, there was a breakthrough. I don't recall if you remember then, Hamo, we were at the park and there was a breakthrough. Whereby it's hmm. just not aligning LLM. It's also aligning human. And then I've that thought has stuck with me for a while. And I don't know if you can actually share the screen right now, Jason. So Shreya actually wrote this thing who values the value this and in it she proposes a workflow and she actually highlights this phenomena which she calls criteria drift right and they actually go as far as saying it is impossible to write good criteria without looking at output and then there was this participant 
may or may not have been me, but you should enforce that we actually look at 20 examples first before writing criteria. So this has stuck with me a lot. Now I'm thinking, so previously I was talking to Hamo, I was asking you how I have this criteria, how can I make sure that it does well? Now my workflow is completely flipped. I'm going to get Gus, some LLM as a judge, some LLM to return input and output. Then I'm going to ask the human to just read that input and output at least 20 or even 50 before they start writing their criteria. Because a lot of times what I'm finding is that when people write a criteria, without actually looking at input and output, the criteria actually doesn't, is a little bit from an ivory tower. It doesn't really match what they actually need to catch and what they actually need to detect. So that's how my thinking has slightly changed. Since then, now I'm saying that let's throw out the criteria from the start. It may actually be harmful if you actually write the criteria without looking at input and output. I've experienced or witnessed a strong cognitive bias. If the company has observability on their LLMs and they have traces, and I ask them to look at their traces and tell me which ones are good and bad, because they already have this AI thing and they're excited about it, they label lots of things as good or whatever. The moment I then say it's good, let me build an LLM as a judge. But now this LLM as judge is going to step in for your shoes. It's going to be as good as you. Then and they're like, no, it's bad. The same data, the same traces that says good or not bad. And it always happens every time. I'm trying to work through, like, how do I shortcut this? What are some techniques I can introduce? There's a, there's a paper to... that basically allows you to find labeler quality to figure out who to fire in a labeling task force. If you have multiple labelers label a single task, then you can basically measure for any individual labeler, whether it correlates with the consensus. Uh, and basically what you can find is they're either going to be correlated, anti-correlated, or not correlated. And anti-correlated basically means that they're adversarial to the task in some way, right? Yeah. This might be someone who is just labeling things too quickly to get paid, low precision, et cetera. And then there's the at random. And the idea is that you can just fire the at random. So I bet there is a way of just distilling that too, where you have different teams and go, oh, the CEO. But then, so when I, I'm always working with the founder or the person in charge doing that <laughs> labeling. <laughs> so I haven't worked in like the scale of having lots of labelers. And, and what you see here is that trying to get this to work is no longer just about technical feasibility. It's no longer just about never problems. was. But yeah, maybe it never was. It's also about how do you manage what people already have, the psychology of it. Maybe you are uh, trying to augment someone. Maybe they already have criteria at the start, but you know the criteria is wrong. Maybe the criteria is overly generic, like what Hamo often uh, tweets about. Or maybe the criteria is just so removed from the output. So what I'm trying to do is put a mechanism in place. Instead of coming to me with your criteria, I said, guys, just let the criteria go. Please just look at the data first and then come to the data, look at it with a fresh pair of eyes before writing the criteria. Just let go of all existing emotions and existing ego, existing attachment to what you already have. I know it sounds a little bit like Eastern philosophy and everything. Yeah. But I, I realize what's really important is to have humility and to respect the data if you want to do this well. Yeah, let me tell another story too, which is that when I was doing this at scale, like basically I had a budget of maybe $300,000 every year to do data labeling. That was a huge, because I was working on the vision side of things. So it was just, we think vision is going to make us money help us make us money. It's very similar to the LLM world, except now we're just using LLMs and LLM with a judge. And it's the same thing because we had GANs, which is image generation and image discrimination. And now we have text generation and text generation. Like nothing has changed. When I did these daily labeling tasks, it was always the case where I would label like 200 to five examples. And again, these are images, so it's much faster than text. And then I would basically produce like a 10 page PDF of just examples and reasons why I gave certain labels. Then I would effectively Okay, like, okay, here's a $1,000 of scale AI, generate labels for me, and I look at the disagreements, and I just continually concatenate on this set. I think it's always been this way. We just, and then we're basically just trying to do a rag over this, like, 20-page PDF. Like, even with Google relevancy, I think Google's relevancy labeling guideline is, like, 27 pages or something, right? This Tesla never... labeling is, like, insane. Yeah. And so it is the case where, like, I just, it's never been easy. It's just been more accessible. And the only difference that has changed is the latency cost trade-off. I don't, because I don't really know what the difference is between a good LLM and someone who is just like a data labeler from like Venezuela, right? Like the abstraction is there's an API behind the scene that gets me some label and I have to attach a PDF to a task ID. And it's just like always been hard. Yeah, yeah I, I think, think Google like, one has, oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think the Google one was 170 pages. Oh. I just looked it up. I don't know why. Wow. Hmm. I don't know which 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 window I'm actually sharing right now. 
Why is this task important? Oh, let me just unshare for now. Yeah, but it's, it's just always been hard because it's always just, and there's even cultural things, right? Like when I was doing content moderation at, at Facebook, you could basically tell that like different countries had different correlations with our gold labels, right? For example, like Western societies have like way higher sensitivity to like animal abuse versus some countries have way higher sensitivity to like nudity and or hate speech like not unsurprisingly like german labelers are just way more sensitive to all hate speech because there's just so, so many cultural things and again like that can probably be distilled in different models as well like different language models probably have different training data which leans one one way or another when it comes to maybe like moderation so to me it's just a cheaper human is this yeah. okay yeah this is the page so i just want to share this is the google search quality guidelines i actually studied this very extensively this is actually I don't know about most folks, but there's not that many public guidelines available. And so I actually wrote something about how to write data labeling and notation guidelines. There's Google and the Bing search one. I think the Bing search one is also like, how many pages is this? It's like 54 pages, but these are great examples of guidelines. If you start from nothing and you just want to learn how to write guidelines, I, th I think these are great examples. So I, I started this um, a lot. Yeah, like in 2020, in 2019, I had to write guidelines on how stylists and art students should label an outfit as good or bad. Can you imagine trying to what, write What that? percentage of AI products, even data, ML products, let's say ML products, because we have more data on that, do you think it's not the data scientists labeling, have this freedom to have labelers or whatever, if you were to guess? I think every big company has data labeling. Look at Scale AI. Like the yeah, exactly. Right? Six months of 2020, 20, six months of 2018 was me evaluating five different data labeling companies and the quality of the labelers and their English competency and, and figuring out, okay, maybe I have American English teachers be the tech, the team leads, and then they manage other teams in the Philippines and Venezuela, and they can give us feedback on ambiguity in the labeling guidelines because the English teachers have just been reading for a long time and they're good at reading, right? Yeah. Then you choose on like, English capabilities and you pay a little bit more for like better English if the grading is more nuanced. Yeah, I also think it depends a lot on the kind of data that you're using. If the kind of data you're using has implicit labels in them, for example, like behavioral data for recommendations or search, right? People click on things. You actually don't need data labeling. But there's a lot of stuff where you actually don't have implicit, you don't have such labels like review. Is this review abusive or not? Does this review talk about, I don't know, does it abuse the author or does it abuse the, the item itself? That's where you need data labeling. Nowadays, most people are just using an LLM to do that basic labeling. Unless the, the task is extremely complex, then maybe LLM you can't do it. But I think most people are just pushing that down to an LLM right now. This was fun. I may need to drop out soon. For folks who have actually read my write-up on LLM evaluations, and you have any comments on what I'm doing right or what I'm doing wrong, DM me. I would really love to from you on what you found success with or what you found has not been successful. I'm continuing to dig deeper into this, talk deeper on this thread. But yeah. Is there anything that me. troubles you about this, like things that are like burning questions that you wish you knew the answer to, but you don't know yet? So I feel like there are a couple of things you need to get this to work. The first one is technical feasibility. If a world-class prompter could write the right prompt, can you get it in the right recon position? I think that's, yes, that can be done. Second one is, so now there, there's two other key buckets. The first one is, is there an automated or augmented process whereby someone can just give them three bullet points on what my criteria are. And you can then take those three bullet points and automatically have that become an actual prompt that gets a good result. So, something like DSPY, right? maybe DSPY is a thing, I don't know. Maybe. I think there you would need basically some active learning approach, right? You could, yeah, exactly, DSPY. So if you have access to model weights, that's a different thing. Yeah. So assuming really, you don't have access to a variance weights. estimate, can you get a variance estimate for a token? And then you how can, do you actually... actually, in lieu of model weights, you can actually run the same thing multiple times and then use that to that many so you, 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 you to like uh, one question that's interesting is you probably talk to more practitioners as a habit because you're trying to survey the field. I'm trying to get the truth. Have you, right. Yeah. yeah. Have you talked to anyone who's used DSPI in production that have that's help them build the product? I've actually talked to a few people who actually rave about DSPI. They said that it's really amazing. Like they use it to generate synthetic few shot prompts that help a lot. 
or they use it to but the thing is i actually don't know what their baseline is did they really try writing the prompt did they really try understanding the best practices of the prop so i i didn't really get to that stage but for most people who i know are good prompt writers who can actually get it to work without using dspy most of them don't actually use dspy for them it's actually harder it's actually more effort to use dspy instead of just rely on their intuition and best practices so th that's one thing getting from criteria to a good prompt they can get good results now the other thing is that in order for you to estimate what good results are you actually need to collect some labeled data let's just say three to 400 labels. Now, how can you collect this labeled data most effectively and most efficiently? Effective means that this labeled data is good. Error rate is probably about plus minus one or 2%. And efficiently means you can probably get it done in a day. If you can put your business leader down, put, say that, okay, I'm just gonna take your entire day's time and just get this labeled data out for me. And then I'll be out of your hair. I'm just gonna use this labeled data to align my LLM. So basically given some amorphous criteria, how can I get the labeled data to evaluate this amorphous criteria? And then how can I, get it to align well with the data samples. Yeah. This is where I'm skeptical. We talked about, okay, when you're designing an evaluator or LM as a judge, the importance of looking at the data very mm. carefully and even writing the critiques yourself one mm. by one and how that changes the human and finds their thinking about what the product should even be. Like DSPY doing it in some iterative loop and key hacking a, a metric basically, yeah. or you're just like, greedily optimizing some metric, which you don't know is good. Because a lot of times the process of doing the manual thing, you discover, hey, this metric actually is not that good. So I, I don't know yet. I am going to be discovering this. So I think how DSPI works is that for prompting, there's people who are good at it and people who know little about it. DSPY brings everyone to the median. For people not so good at it, it can bring you to get better at it. But for people who are really good at it, it's actually just harder for them to achieve what they need to achieve. And this is where I need help, I think. People, when they say how about they love DSPY, they almost unanimously say the same thing. Hey, we don't like prompting. We yeah. think that prompting should go away and should be like programming. And you've heard that in a recent meeting that we had together. Hey, it needs to yeah. be more like programming and we need to get away from this messy prompting. And I feel very opposite. I want to do prompting because the magic of LLM for me is prompting, but I don't understand that side. So I feel like I'm disconnected. I don't have the empathy I, enough. I, I feel a little bit different. I, I, I have the same viewpoint as you, Hamel. And I feel a bit different from people who say that they want to make prompting more programmatic. I feel like writing a prompt, it's almost like writing requirements or specifications. A lot of people who say that they don't want to do a prompt. They just want to write some program to optimize some metric. A lot of them, they don't want to think through what they write what the specifications or what the right requirement is. The thing is, because if you have to think through, if you just put that into a prompt, a lot of times the prompt will actually do well. So prompting is actually thinking. Prompting is actually writing and writing is actually thinking. So you have to think really hard. So sometimes you have to think really hard to get the LLM aligned to what you actually want to do and write great instructions, right? What, what Jason mentioned, writing good instructions is really difficult, both for humans and for LLMs. The SPI is so, it treats like a hyperparameter optimization problem. I don't think writing prompts is Yes, there are some semblances to hyperparameter optimization, but I think it's more close to writing instructions than hyperparameter optimization. All right, man. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty open uh, to it, by the way. I'm not hating DSPY. I want to find, actually, it would be great to find something where it makes sense. So am I. So if you have gotten DSPY to work, getting it to align your LM, please reach out to Hamo, Jason, or me. Just DM us. I would really love to learn from you. I, I'm, I'm not an expert at DSPY by no means, uh, but I just want to learn how to get be more effective at it. Or if you also have examples that, you know, I tried it versus I, I wrote the props myself and it just doesn't work. Also reach out to us. This was great fun, man.